Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, for this webinar on Advanced Process Controls, Theory and Applications in SAGD with the SPE Young Professionals. My name is Brendan Ma, and I'm part of the programs team for the SPE Young Professionals. Before introducing my speaker, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, though, uh, Chevron, Hexon, Geologic Systems, and Ovintiv for their continued support of our technical programs. I'd also like to let everyone know that we're currently live streaming this webinar via our SPE Calgary Facebook account. As well, we're also recording the session, which will be available via our SPE Calgary YouTube account. Lastly, I'd also like to highlight a, a few upcoming SPE YP events and initiatives. Um, we'll be hosting a webinar on February 2nd on whether there is a future for oil and gas in a net zero world. There will also be another webinar on Data Science 101 on February 12th. If you haven't signed up for these, make sure to go check out our page. Um, our annual Young Professional Ski Trip will be held on March 5th to 7th uh, with the group visiting Revelstoke Mountain Resort. Uh, also make sure to check out our webpage if you wanna register for that. And finally, uh, make sure to check out our Strava Club, a great way to stay active and connect with other young professionals. Uh, you can download the Strava app and register using SPEYP Calgary. So our webinar today is on advanced process controls a growing area of development within the oil and gas industry as operators attempt to maximize the value of their existing real-time data. APC offers an opportunity to apply data analytic tools and techniques to generate dynamic models that characterize the observed behavior of the process. Helping our industry move away from single input, single output controls into more complex and complete predictive control systems. Our guest today is a staff engineer at, in the advanced automation team at Snowis Energy. He has 13 years of industry experience in manufacturing and energy. He designs and develops process automation solutions for Snowis's thermal assets. He graduated from Waterloo with a degree in mechatronics and is currently pursuing a master's in computer science. Um, so thank you, Thiago, for joining us. I'll, I'll now pass it on to you. Thanks, Brendan. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yep, you're good. Okay, perfect. Uh, so as Brandon mentioned, I uh, will be talking today about APC. Uh, so APC builds upon uh, your traditional DCS systems uh, and base process control systems that exist on the PLCs at your well pads or operating facilities. Uh, we'll be talking about what APC is, why we do it, examples of APC in the SEGD industry, um, and then what optimization opportunities are out there and kind of where this technology is going and evolving. So in your traditional facility, um, you've got your valves, pumps, tanks. Uh, they're connected to the input and output systems uh, through a DCS and PLC systems, which consist of your uh, base process control system. So this automation will open and close the valves, measure your temperatures, pressures, flows, turn on and off your pumps and do all of your traditional single input, single output controls. Uh, you'll get data reporting that goes up into your corporate network with trending, reporting and analysis. Uh, where APC fits in is it uh, adds edge computing to your base process control system and then adds an APC layer on top of that. So you can do a lot of supervisory type systems tying in your different operating areas and looking at the plant as a single entity instead of individual pieces of equipment. Um, and then you'll get a lot of KPIs that can be used uh, both for reporting upstream as well as bringing real-time values in from the uh, open business world, things like futures pricing, lab data, um, operating engineering targets and limits that may be changing dynamically. So you can do a couple different things on your APC layer. Uh, first, there's a lot of analytics that goes on. Uh, you have to recognize and handle suspect data, figure out when your data set's incomplete. Uh, you're also doing a lot of prediction and simulation in the APC layer. And that all feeds into the actual APC algorithms, which use uh, machine learning techniques to develop these first principles models, uh, as well as simple transformation models. And you're recognizing the different process limits and states, setting limits for where you should be operating your facility, and then real time calculating the best set of outputs that uh, 
should be run and sent out your various equipment. Um, the one thing that, because this is actual industrial software, uh, it ensures that failures in communication or equipment hardware failures are handled gracefully and that your plant keeps on running or at least islands itself while uh, the system's down. Uh, so in your traditional DCS and PLCs, you've got single input, single output uh, controllers. This is typical of what you'd have like with, the, you think of a thermostat in a house or a cruise control in a car. You've got a single input speed and a set point, also speed, and it's controlling throttle input to your engine. With APC, uh, you're looking at multiple input, multiple output systems. So you're looking at various instrumentation coming in, controlling lots of different pieces going out. And the incentive for APC uh, is pretty varied. You get safer, safer operations because instead of looking at individual pieces, you're looking at the whole system. So where pieces of equipment um, would have to normally protect themselves individually, you could offload certain systems by looking at upstream and downstream equipment and seeing how they could uh, help address the safety issue. And you're also ranking your set points based on importance. You get increased stability because instead of looking at just the one instrument controlling the one valve, you're looking at all the upstream and downstream disturbances that are happening and then predicting their impact at that downstream valve. So you're prepared for what's coming up. Uh, and because you're doing that, you get reduced variability around your set points because everything's working together. Where you might have a disturbance in one area of the plant, it could be mitigated by the time it gets to your boilers or uh, uh, your sales oil tanks, for instance. You've got uh, better plant flexibility for handling different uh, pricing environments. Uh, if this was a refinery, uh, you'd be looking at real-time pricing of your different products and you could be adjusting your cuts to maximize profitability. And uh, when you do all this, you're gonna get closer to your optimum operating point. Uh, there's also a reduction in maintenance because instead of tuning these individual controllers, you've kind of set everything up in a system. And when you change one thing, um, the impacts uh, are already measured and known at the other pieces of equipment. So in the process control world, you got multiple different levels of control. You have your traditional regulatory control, uh, which is your single in, single out, as well as cascade control. Cascade controls where you have one controller that feeds into another. So you might have a temperature controller that sets the flow rate of uh, a commodity to a pump, and you're controlling temperature indirectly with that flow. Uh, enhanced regulatory control builds on your basic uh, single in, single out systems by adding open loop feed forward control, uh, which allows you to look at disturbances that might be happening in your system and then using them to predict the impact on your uh, whatever output you happen to be trying to control. And uh, the main topic of today's presentation are gonna be on these top two layers on optimization and model-based control. So we're bringing in the field of machine learning and then multivariable predictive control uh, and then adding optimization on top of that. Uh, just some terms I'll be using a lot in this presentation. Uh, controlled variables, uh, these are the values that we're trying to use to control our process. Uh, they're gonna be things like flow rates, temperatures, pressures. Uh, you've got manipulated variables. These are the handles that we're using to control those uh, controlled variables or CVs. These are gonna be things like fan speeds, pressures, uh, feed rates, uh, anything that can impact these controlled variables. And then you also have disturbance variables, which are things that you don't have direct control over, but are things that impact your process. Um, things like emulsion temperature coming in or ambient temperature. Uh, you don't have control of ambient temperature, but they may make a pretty big impact in terms of your cooling envelope for your plant. Unmeasured disturbances are things that we can't account for, but we need to react to. Uh, there are things that you don't have any measurement on, uh, but you might have a pipe that, you know, periodically dumps flow into a valve, uh, into a tank that you need to uh, still control level on. 
critical variables are things that the user or the engineer has defined as essential to the operation of the controller. And these are things that you can't live without. So if you get bad values or an instrumentation failure or any of these points, you're, that's when you tell the optimizer to stop and you hand everything back to the base process control system. So single input, out, single output control um, is a controller where you have one process variable coming in and you have a set point for that one value and you control only one thing. So this is typically a valve output, flow rate, uh, temperature. And where APC differs from that is you have these controllers that, are, that can be pretty massive. You can take any number of inputs, uh, which each have their own set points, but these can be ranges instead of individual numbers. And you'll have any number of outputs. And the number of inputs and outputs don't have to be the same. You could have three inputs controlling 10 outputs uh, or 10 inputs controlling three outputs. And those degrees of freedom control uh, determine what you're able to do and what the benefits of the APC are for your individual application. With a traditional single input, single output controller, you've got a target that you've set and it comes in, uh, feedback from some part of your plant or process. The difference of these two terms is the error. And then your PID controller looks at uh, the proportional integral and differential values that the uh, engineers set up and then the controller determines an output. Um, it's strictly limited to one value coming in and then one thing it's controlling. Uh, an APC controller is quite a bit more sophisticated and it, because it's looking at such a bigger picture, uh, it is quite a bit more complicated. Uh, we'll break each one of these parts down in this presentation and talk about what they bring to the pie. Uh, but in general, you have a prediction model that takes all of your disturbances, uh, all your manipulated values coming in, as well as your plant values for your controlled variables. And then it uses that to get a state of the world and then outputs a prediction. That prediction is then used to figure out where you are relative to where you wanna be. And uh, either the control algorithm or the optimizer determines a set of moves uh, to get you to where you wanna be. And then that's output to the process. Uh, the whole APC kind of journey begins with model creation and step testing. Like any machine learning um, project or application, you need to create a test set and you're gonna use that uh, training and test set uh, to create your models and then validate your models that they're effective. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna step each one of your manipulated variables and then see how they impact your controlled values. Uh, and you got to do multiple steps for each MV to CV relationship to actually characterize the whole thing. And you're going to get a model for each one of those one-to-one -one relationships that you'll put into a matrix and the controller used to do its predictions. The uh, step testing plan is pretty critical. Uh, if you try using historical data, uh, you have control systems in the plant that are on and you'll end up getting uh, kind of unexpected relationships where uh, instead of a temperature to temperature relationship, your machine learning will pick up that there's no temperature relationship, but the temperature is related to this valve. Uh, but the valve output's actually controlled by some PID loop somewhere. So you have to disable all of that and do the step testing so that you can get the underlying like first principles uh, reactions. And what the step testing might look like if you had two manipulated variables and then two controlled uh, variables, you would do a bunch of different steps on MV1 and MV2. You'd be testing for interaction between these two. Uh, and by doing both of them in different amounts and in different, uh, uh, different ratios of the two, you'll be able to isolate uh, what the independent impacts are of each one of these two manipulated values. It'll also tell you whether your expected models are gonna be linear over time. You could get a much different reaction uh, between manipulated MV1 and CV1 at the high end of the range versus the low end of the range. And by varying and doing a pretty comprehensive step testing plan, uh, you'll be able to quantify that. 
so an example that's typically used in these uh, APC explanations is a shower. Uh, you've got a pretty simple 2MV, 2CV system. Your two manipulated variables are the two hot water, like the hot water and the cold water valve. And the controlled variables are the flow and temperature coming out of your shower head. So you'd end up with a two by two matrix in the APC controller. Uh, we'll end up with uh, putting just arbitrary limits for this example. So we'll set the flow between five and 10 liters per minute and the controlled temperature between 35 and 40 degrees. And uh, the MVs, each valve can be open zero to hundred percent. And if you step test your uh, shower, you might end up with models that look like this. These are all Laplace transforms. Uh, the Laplace transform allows you to characterize the dead time. So the amount of time from when you make a change to when you start seeing it in your output uh, or in your measured control variable. Uh, you get the dynamics of how long it takes to actually rise and react, and then the settling time. And the way to read this is uh, for a one unit change in let's say the position of the hot water valve, you're gonna get a one unit change in the temperature. Uh, I've just set up unit gains here just for simplicity. And then similarly on the MV2, uh, which is the cold water valve, if you open up the cold water valve, you're going to reduce the, temp uh, reduce the combined temperature. But in both cases, you're going to increase the total flow coming out of the shower head. Um, in order to make this a little bit more sophisticated, let's say you have some potential issues. Uh, Let's say your cold water temperature coming into your house varies or your hot water supply varies. Let's say you have a really small hot water tank uh, or it's a, a shared hot water tank in an apartment. You could add two disturbance uh, variables, a hot water temperature probe on the inlet temp of the water coming in and then a temperature probe on the cold water coming in. Uh, these two both have positive relationships because uh, an increase in the cold water temperature or an increase in the hot water temperature are both going to increase your combined water temperature uh, when they, they merge. And so your overall matrix looks like this. And the way the controller is going to use this is uh, it's going to look at your uh, combined controlled value so like CV1, and if the temperature is too high, it's gonna look at what moves it can make across the spectrum of these two MVs to address it. So if the water combined water temperature was too high, it could either reduce MV1 or increase the amount of cold water coming in, but it's gonna be limited to uh, what it can do based on your water flow combined. So if the water flow happens to be at your, whatever your high limit is, uh, you can't really increase the amount of cold water so you can only reduce the amount of hot water. Uh, and the controller is not uh, like a linear system like this, like it, it can make more than one move. So if you were, wanted to maximize your water flow, you would actually uh, reduce your hot water and increase your cold water and keep that total water flow right at the upper limit. Uh, similarly, let's say your hot water temperature in your tank was declining. Uh, you would pick up, let's say, a one degree drop in the inlet hot water coming in, uh, which would put you off target here. And then you would choose to either increase the hot water or reduce the cold water, again, with the same water flow restriction. So how does this relate to a SAG-D process? Um, in a SAG-D process, you have multiple parallel systems, as well as a lot of interactions and uh, recirculatory flows in the plant. Uh, your emulsion coming into the plant is very hot and you're trying to recover as much heat as you can into your boiler feed water so you can reduce uh, your fuel gas costs and increase production by getting rid of any thermal bottlenecks that could happen. And we use APC to do that by shifting the thermal loads to where we have capacity. So the emulsion comes in and in a traditional system, you recover about half of the thermal energy in the emulsion with your boiler feed water exchangers. So half of that goes into your boiler feed water uh, warming. Uh, you then go into a deoiling vessel where you split up your sales oil and your produce water. 
Uh, your sales oil gets cooled by glycol exchangers. And the produced water ends up going through another set of boiler feed water exchangers. And then finally, the, the trim on that circuit is the glycol aerial coolers. So we recover quite a bit of the heat coming on the emulsion, uh, about just over two thirds of it uh, through the boiler feed water system. Uh, <clears throat> and then an addition incremental 25% uh, or so in the produced water system. And then we vent some of it through uh, aerial coolers to the glycol in the ambient. Uh, and where the APC comes in is you're gonna try to maximize the amount of flow coming into the plant. And the capacity of these aerial coolers is gonna change quite a bit with your ambient temperature. So on those cool summer nights, you'll have the ability to increase flow, but then during the daytime, when the capacity goes down, you'll wanna ramp back. And if you have extra capacity, you'll want the APC system to dial back your glycol coolers and put as much heat back into the boiler feed water as we can. Um, <clears throat> this is a very simplified model of what it's gonna look like. Uh, the different curves here are just directional to show you the relationship. But in a typical SAG-D plant, you have these very dense matrices with lots of MVs and lots of CVs um, and very few columns where you only have one thing in them. And what this does is it allows the APC controller to have a lot of degrees of freedom. It can make many different moves to uh, address each particular violation on your controlled var uh, variables. And because all the MVs aren't necessarily correlated, it can do a lot of inversions. So move one up and then move one down to isolate a particular uh, CV value. And this allows the optimizer to have very fine tuned and uh, good control because it has a lot of different handles it can use. And by setting pricing or weights, the, those different handles, uh, you can come up with the optimal solution that either maximizes uh, plant capacity or heat recovery. So the importance of that really dense matrix uh, is all about degrees of freedom. <clears throat> if you have a perfect match between the number of manipulated variables and controlled variables, then you'll only have one correct solution that meets all of your constraints with the number of handles you have to pull. In a case where you don't have enough MVs, so you don't have enough handles to try to control the things that you wanna control, you can then rank each one of your CVs. Uh, it could be in terms of cost or safety uh, so that you only meet the object objectives that are important to you. And then if you get additional MVs, like let's say vessels come off maintenance or you uh, take things out of operator mode and put them back into the APC controllers realm of things, uh, you can start addressing those incremental uh, objectives as you have additional handles to control them with. Uh, where we normally operate is you'll typically have more MVs because you have all these parallel vessels, parallel valves, pumps, and you'll have more MVs than you need to control. So you'll have uh, multiple solutions, like almost an infinite number of solutions where the APC controller can then optimize all of those different move sets and pick the one that uh, brings you to your economic optimum. So how does it do that? Uh, so first it looks at all of your MVs and DVs, looks in the past, uh, and then tr runs them through your models, uh, all the models you have, and then predicts what's gonna happen to your CVs. Uh, this is just showing one line, but in reality, this is an array of predictions for each one of your CVs. Uh, you then take that prediction, compare it to where your limits are, that either operations or engineering sets, and that delta between where you're predicted to be and then where you are, or where you want to be, uh, that's your error term. Your error term then gets run through the inverse of the models. Uh, and it runs the inverse through all the different models. So you'll get a bunch of different move sets on what you can do to your manipulated variables and at what times to get you to uh, your optimum state. And it tries to do all of this without violating any of the limits you have set up. And it also tries to minimize the number of moves. So if it sees that you're kind of drifting into the right uh, uh, back toward compliance uh, within its horizon window that you've set up, it won't actually make a move. And you can see that here. 
so here you have a CV that's rising up. Uh, it's predicted to make a move going down and then the CV is coming back up within this uh, tolerance window, uh, which is based on your uh, response criteria that's set up by the models, like the actual uh, parameters that we have for control. And what the APC is gonna do is it's gonna look at the predictions if it does nothing. So this uh, gray line here is the kind of no move case. And that's based off of the, what's happened in the past. And it calculates the minimum move required to get to within your compliance. So within your low and high limit. And so it's just gonna make the bare minimum move here to take this unforced curve uh, back into compliance. Now, the question everyone always has is how accurate do the models need to be? And the answer is it doesn't have to be that accurate. Uh, it all depends on how frequently you're running your APC algorithm. Uh, if you're predicting out, uh, let's say 15 minutes, your models have to be quite good, or it really depends on the system. But in general, let's say you're predicting out 15 minutes, your models have to be quite a bit better than if you're predicting out one minute. Because in one minute, you can measure again, figure out what your delta is, uh, based on what your instrumentation is telling you you're going to be, and then do another prediction a minute out. Whereas if you run it only every 15 minutes, um, a, lot, a lot can go wrong in a 15 minute window. So your models have to be pretty much bang on. Um, I'm just using that as an example, but directionally, the uh, longer your time between runs, the better your model quality needs to be. And similarly, the shorter your time is, uh, the more you're relying on feedback and less on prediction. Um, the controller uses the models that we talked about, but there's also different ways to improve your prediction. Um, it's got state estimation. So let's say you're filling a tank. Uh, if it's always off by the same amount, it's gonna learn that it's always off and then adjust. That's uh, called your bias error. And it takes about one closed loop response time for it to figure out how much it's off and then make that adjustment. Um, you also got, uh, um, sorry, that, that was ramp error. Bias error is uh, things that are like more Boolean or binary in nature. So you might get noise from liquid splashing that increases your level and creates a bias in the measurement. The controller knows that it couldn't actually increase the level that quickly, and then it, it could make an offset from that. And then the ramp would be your ramp rate if it's filling a tank and the level's increasing less than expected it's gonna make a compensating change to correct that model error. All right, so that was mainly this prediction model part and then this unmeasured disturbance to so that state estimation and uh, biasing. So now we've got a pretty good prediction of where we're gonna be and where we wanna be. Uh, we put it through that range control algorithm and it tells us what moves we should make to get back into control, but we haven't optimized anything. All we've got is, uh, We've got the plant within our operating control limits. So if we're in a steady state condition, so nothing's violating a limit that an operator set, the controller can uh, kind of fork off here and then run the steady state optimizer. And the steady state optimizer is what actually pushes us to our optimum economic target. And there's three levels of optimization. Uh, You've got your local optimization, which is right on your uh, base level uh, unit op controller. And uh, this is kind of a greedy controller. Like if you give it resources, it will optimize to the best of its ability within that constraint. It doesn't care if another unit op is struggling. Uh, it will just you know take and run up to whatever limit. So if a little is good, more is better up until you tell it no more. Uh, Multi-level optimization is the idea of coordinating resources across different unit ops or process units. Uh, this ties together multiple different uh, APC controllers and allows it to uh, coordinate constraints. And then the third level is more uh, plant-wide or multi-plant. Uh, it's more of an executive controller. Uh, you might use this if you have like certain pipeline nominations or sales commitments. Uh, and you have a distributed uh, set of production facilities and you wanna optimize your sale agreement across uh, very different uh, um, 
very different facilities that aren't really related on the operating level. Most of the gains with APC are at the second level. Uh, first, to get the unit stable, you're operating within, within the ditches and uh, you're optimizing to the best of your knowledge at the local level. And then once you start uh, coordinating the different controllers together, uh, the majority of your incremental savings are here. And there's very little at the uh, upstream part here because if you look at it, this is more in the seconds. This is like minutes to hours or days. And then these are more like you know months or quarter type optimization. Uh, and again, you can only do the optimization if you have extra degrees of freedom. So you need more MVs than you have CVs to be able to do optimization. Uh, the optimization is done using linear programming or if you have a nonlinear problem, quadratic programming. And this messy slide here, um, what it shows you is you've got two MVs, so MV1 and MV2, so purple and green. And you've got a low limit and a high limit uh, for each MV. And this rectangle here is the box or your feasibility region for where you can actually run your MVs uh, purely based on a technical limit. Uh, for each CV, you've got a low, a low and a high limit and then uh, a low and a high limit for CV2. And where these two, uh, like this one's a rhombus here, but where these two shapes intersect, this is your actual fe feasibility limit. Uh, you can operate your MVs higher than this, but you'll be violating CV number two uh, or lower than this, but then you'll be violating a different CV. Uh, so this is your actual operating limit that restricts, uh, respects both where you can operate each valve or MV, as well as the constraints you have on your controlled variables. So they would be like the temperatures, pressures, flows. Uh, one more thing. Uh, when you're optimizing, so this is the optimization envelope here. So the intersection of those two shapes, your optimal point is always gonna be at the corner of this uh, feasibility region. And you determine how you're gonna optimize which MVs or CVs uh, using product value optimization. So you can assign costs for moving uh, your manipulated variables or your controlled variables. So your controlled variables might be uh, sales oil production. Uh, your MVs could be fuel, gas, uh, electricity, chemical. So you can assign costs to everything you're touching or measuring. And uh, the optimizer is gonna to try to minimize that cost function. Uh, these, these weights or costs can be real, uh, so you can take market data uh, in the case that you know it, uh, or in the case of SAG D, typically the weights are an order of magnitude apart, uh, so you can just kind of rank them and the controller will optimize them uh, one commodity at a time. Um, in that cost function, uh, a positive number means that the weight has cost or the, the thing you're consuming has cost and a negative number means it earns revenue or has a negative cost. So it'll tr always try to uh, increase things that make you money and reduce the things that cost you money. And you just have to be clever on how you do this or you might end up with a situation where uh, if I reduce all my natural gas usage, then uh, you minimize costs, but you also make no products. So you need to make sure that that cost function is actually representative of your actual facilities, inputs and outputs. And the optimization only occurs during steady state. So you take your values from your IO, uh, that's typically within your DCS or your PLCs. There's a steady state algorithm that detects whether everything's within your controlled limits. Uh, if you pass that test, uh, it looks for gross errors that in the data that could exist. Then we run the actual optimization. So we push uh, the CVs through the models backwards, figure out our moves. We check whether that's consistent with the limits we have for each MV. So can we actually move it to where we want to get to? Uh, and then we implement it and enforce it out to the DCS to actually do the, that action.
Um, so that first level of optimization, it's built into pretty much every APC controller platform um, that's sold. The two major players are Honeywell and then DMC. Um, this provides optimization on a unit-wide basis. Uh, and again, it considers each unit on its own, like winner take all. The multi-unit optimization is tying those different units together. And uh, you create another layer of optimization on top of that local band. So you have these individual APC controllers, each one kind of controlling a process area. And they'll report back what their constraints are. Uh, and this APC optimizer kind of has visibility into what each APC controller uh, is doing and what its state is and we'll coordinate the constraints and moves across them. And the major benefit of this second level of optimization, once you've got the first kind of hierarchy of APC controls, is that you get it for free, basically. Uh, because you've already developed the models between each one of your MVs and CVs, uh, rolling it up one step and then checking which ones are common comes almost for free. And uh, you end up with a lot more savings on the second level because you're maximizing uh, the profitability of different unit ops. And almost always it makes sense to run one part of your plant inefficient in order to increase the efficiency of the rest of the plant. Um, and uh, because the kind of you have the supervisor, APC controller and the underlying controllers, the addition of uni new units or new controllers becomes really easy because you can duplicate or parallelize the different controllers and then just roll them up into the modeling. And it would look something like this. So you'd have each application, uh, each application would have its own models and you would just check off which models, like which MVs from one app feed into the other. I'm going to skip this slide just for time here. So the CVs and DVs uh, on your APC applications, uh, they can be instruments, uh, OPC values, calculations, uh, soft sensor applications, which are derived from you know, first principles or just a, a regular mathematical formula. And uh, starting in the newest version of most platforms, you can start implementing Python processes and applications. Uh, your MVs have to be a physical output point or some other thing that you're controlling. And it needs that feedback because uh, you obviously can't have a synthesized output because you won't get that closed loop interaction that you're expecting. Uh, so this is kind of the emerging space within APC. Uh, you uh, can use these soft sensors that you can write in Python or in the host APC's uh, native language as an input. Uh, the major benefits versus writing your own like kind of Python application that does all the control itself is that you inherit all of the validation, rate of change limits, uh, abnormal condition detecting and alarming that most APC platforms provide. Uh, but what it does give you is the full horsepower of most uh, Windows and Linux computing environments, as well as the full open source library of uh, different Python and uh, .NET uh, libraries. You can incorporate lab updates or different data. Uh, so Python 3 is now supported and it allows you to use TensorFlow, uh, Pandas, NumPy, Scikit-Learn, and you can make your own different CV. So let's say you had a security camera and you had a sight glass on a tank you could actually write a image detection thing that measures the level in the tank where you don't have a level detector and uh, use that as a CV to control some sort of flow rates or uh, uh, pump on off control for that, that tank. That would not really be possible uh, without using image recognition. Uh, you'd have to install physical uh, level instrumentation on the tank. Um, so I know that was a lot. Uh, if you, uh, thank you for listening to the presentation. And if you have any questions, uh, I've got uh, I think 15 minutes left here. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Diego. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, 
Absolutely. Let's kick it off with some questions. And I didn't mention it in the beginning of the presentation here, but uh, if any of the viewers do have any questions for Tiago, please do submit them uh, via the Zoom application at the bottom. There's a Q&A window. Um, type the questions in there and we'll try to get to as many as we can within the next 15 minutes or so. Um, so yeah, I, I did have a couple of questions here to kind of kick us off. Um, one thing was, uh, you kind of talked about that there are many degrees of freedom within APC uh, controllers, for example, in the systems. And, and you talked about there, there's, you can even do inversion where you have, have one CV goes up, another goes down. How does the uh, APC determine the best sequence of moves? Um, going forward, and I think you talked a little bit about pricing and weights as well, but maybe you could elaborate on that. Uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a couple different mechanisms. Um, so if there's only one kind of feasible solution, then it's gonna do that kind of trajectory. But uh, let's say you have a long-term solution using the weights and pricing, but it takes a long time to get there. Uh, the system is gonna try to do a suboptimal solution first and then transition to the long-term optimal solution. So let's say you've got something that's uh, extremely costly, but gets you out of your violation scenario. It'll do that to get back within the controlled kind of steady state environment and then transition to that optimized solution using your, uh, your weights, pricing, um, and uh, any rate of change limits, because uh, you have quite a bit of control there uh, in terms of how you define the actual trajectory that you calculate out. Perfect, oh, thank you. Um, another question here is, how important is uh, data filtering to implement APC on large systems? And I know you talked a little bit about uh, like the critical values, I think it was, uh, and then kind of reverting back to the, the basic system, but um, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, yeah, data filtering is quite important. Um, in each one of the frameworks, you're gonna have a validation set or a toolbox um, it'll look at rate of change, uh, maximum move sizes, um, time where a value can freeze. So if you have, let's say, uh, high frequency data or like a data point with a lot of noise, you might want to put a moving average on that. Uh, so filter out those big moves because you don't want the controller to be reacting to um, noise in the signal. You want to increase that signal to the noise ratio as much as you can. And then you also want to set up the rate of change limits. So if you know that a certain value can only move so fast uh, due to physical constraints or uh, some other reason, like let's say there's a, uh, a max flow limitation, you'd want to cap that at that, uh, at that limitation so that you're not uh, reacting to things that are obviously impossible. Perfect, makes sense. Um, I had a question come in here. Uh, it says, hi, Tiago, great presentation. Uh, did you come across any bottlenecks in the basic process control level that impacted the implementation of APC for optimization? And it says, for example, control logic uh, in constitute, <laughs> sorry, uh, across different areas in the basic process control system. How did you overcome this? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so. With a lot of these SAG-D plants, like they typically grow in phases and not every phase is the same. Um, there's also, you're also touching a lot of different parts of the plant. So there are a lot of inconsistencies, especially on tunings uh, between the same controllers that control the same piece of equipment, just in two different geographical areas, uh, or one piece of equipment might not exist uh, in one area of the plant where it does in the other. So. In the first case, uh, you either have to tune all of the base process control systems so that they're consistent across, or that forces you to model each system individually. So you can't do a modular copy and paste approach. Um, the uh, kind of third alternative is instead of doing that and going with individual models, you can kind of build the base process control tunings into your APC controller. So instead of outputting, let's say, a a flow set point, you could actually uh, control, like let's say the, the VFD speed or the valve position directly, which controls the flow directly. And you'll build that tuning and kind of set standards 
for the whole plant within the APC app itself. Uh, that would get you around having to tune and make the base process control consistent. Uh, and it also gives you quite a bit of control in terms of uh, uh, unexpected like failures, or let's say someone goes in and tunes a section of the plant, not knowing that it's under APC control. Uh, because you've, you're controlled it right to the physical bare metal, um, you've kind of abstracted that, that problem away. If a piece of equipment doesn't exist in a different part of the plant, you either have to create a soft sensor to simulate that piece, uh, or you have to split that off as a separate sort of phase or application. Does that answer your question? I believe it does. Um, I believe it does. Thanks. Uh, another question here, and I think we've kind of touched on a little bit of these already, but the question was really um, like, what do you see as the, the biggest hurdles or challenges in implementing APC on specifically legacy or existing assets, for example? Um, a lot of the times, like the, the biggest hurdle is proving the value up front, I would say. Uh, APC in general is pretty light on the capital spend, but very time intensive, and it takes a long time to study the problem. Uh, and a lot of times you can measure that you're running suboptimally, but it's very hard to commit to how much you can improve that process by. And, and you can't commit that you're going to improve it like by 100%. Uh, so the biggest hurdle is basically like committing to some partial fraction of that and proving the justification and that allows the project to proceed. Makes sense. Great. Um, another question here, it's kind of two sets of questions combined is, hi, Tiago, do you have an APC tool such as Aspen Tech or Honeywell uh, APC? Um, and then the follow-up question after that is, some companies are trying to do model predictive control by using machine learning approaches. What is the difference between APC and the machine learning based MPC method? Do you think APC can be replaced by the machine learning MPC? Thanks. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'll answer the first part of that question. Uh, so yeah, we are using Honeywell's APC Forge or the old Profit Suite uh, framework. Uh, we also have uh, an advanced control application environment, which is a, a, a Honeywell server that allows us to run .NET code on, and that creates us allows us to do like custom solutions where uh, we're operating outside the bounds of that traditional APC framework. But wherever we can use the uh, out-of-the-box Honeywell framework, we do. Uh, and the APC Forge product uh, works pretty well. Uh, I haven't used DMC in the past, but the functionality and feature sets are very close. Um, on the second question, uh, APC uses uh, machine learning techniques um, to do the model development. So you do step testing, you create this training set. And then there's a bunch of closed loop IDs which run it through these different statistical machine learning approaches to build the models. Um, and those are like, you know, first or second order uh, Laplace transforms. So they are quite limited. Uh, the, uh, where that differs from using, let's say, uh, you know, your traditional machine learning neural networks, uh, is that it, it can't get as many of the interactions or the changes in time. And you can adopt both or make a hybrid solution. Like Honeywell and Aspen Tech uh, are evolving to that. And Honeywell's latest release allows you to build that, uh, those Python applications within the APC environment. So you can leverage as much or as little of those traditional tools as you want, and then incorporate uh, pretty much any machine learning library that you want on the up front thing. So it's, it's kind of a wrapper for that uh, machine learning library. And it gives you like the integration with your traditional DCS, that uh, data validation, uh, the shedding and the safety functionality that you would have to create from the ground up if you just wrote the whole thing yourself. I see, I see. Okay. Um, another question here. It says, thanks for the presentation, Tiago. Uh, can you shed some light on the most inventive or innovative soft sensor setups that you've come across yourself? Um, yeah, so on the soft sensor side, um, 
We've got a couple different applications that we have in commercial use. Uh, one is uh, like a steam quality soft sensor for predicting uh, your, your steam quality rates using fouling in the tubes, uh, using a number of the different inputs. Uh, we also are using it for predicting uh, the equilibrium point of the emulsion header feeding your SAG-D plants. Uh, so breaking that down into a, a pressure at a single point uh, using a, like a drag and hydraulic model of the whole uh, pipeline system. Oh, interesting. Those seems uh, like very useful things. <laughs> uh, definitely in the assets that we operate. Um, another question here. Great presentation. Uh, how does APC and optimizers deal with validation problem indicating instrument errors or drift in the period pending instrument maintenance or replacement? Um, touched a little bit on that, I think. Um, but yeah, could you elaborate a bit more? Uh, so instrument errors, like if you got a frozen value or an NAN value, um, each particular CV or MV uh, uses those validation criteria. And if the value is in one critical point, uh, it will either drop it from the calculation and continue optimizing using what knowledge it knows. Uh, if it's a critical point, it'll shed the whole application and stop control and revert back to your base systems. Um, if the uh, point is going in and out, um, what you can actually do is you can use uh, your models that you've built to both filter that value as well as predict uh, what the expected value is. So let's say you have a, an instrument that keeps dropping to zero. Well, it picks up that it can't actually drop to zero because that rate of change is too quick. And then it replaces that zero with what it thinks that value is given on given what else is happening with your plant uh, using that model matrix that I uh, showed. Well, that's fair. And, and I think the last little bit to that is uh, um, drift as well. Um, is there any way that the can tackle drift in the data? Uh, Drift, um, if it is an integrating value, then you can use some of those state estimations to calculate for drift. Uh, it, it'll kind of adjust that bias up or down. For things that are self-regulating, it won't really know that there's drift. Uh, it'll just take the bias at face value. Uh, you'll either have to have multiple sensors redundant and then uh, use them for confirmation and error detection, uh, or it just ends up getting built in as a model mismatch and it reduces the performance of your system. Fair. Um, here's a question kind of going back to the, the thread of, of machine learning and incorporating machine learning into the ABC. It says, great presentation. In your experience, how far are we in terms of letting a peer machine learning model or agent controlling a process on its own with minimum human operator with minimum human operators and oversight. Have you seen any real world application in oil and gas, which are purely machine learning control driven? Yeah, I mean, a lot of these systems do pretty well during steady state operations. Um, where they typically fail is kind of related to that uh, uh, the previous question there, like if you have instrumentation uh, failures or maintenance issues and they don't get addressed and they start compounding, uh, you need that human operator oversight to like return back from these abnormal conditions, uh, recover from these uh, sometimes like catastrophic failures, or uh, let's say you have a, a blackout and you need a black start to plant. Uh, in terms of cruise control, um, some of these machine learning models and APC applications do fairly good at just kind of maintaining everything steady. Uh, but in terms of a full encompassed safety critical uh, application that, that that's, that's just lights out with no human operator intervention, I think we're uh, quite, a, quite a bit far from that. Uh, I, I haven't seen uh, too much regulator willingness or engineering willingness to sign off on that level of control. Uh, and if you were to do something like that, uh, you probably have to have that machine learning model and uh, 
its envelope very, very heavily designed and constrained so that it pre pre behaves predictably even when the inputs are uh, unpredictable. No, that's fair. And kind of final question here, kind of uh, piggybacking on that is, um, what do you see then in the future of APC within the industry? Um, kind of, I think we talked a little bit about the long term, but maybe even the shorter term uh, on how you see the technology evolve. Uh, so I think there's going to be quite a bit of uh, like hybridization between what you're seeing happening in the IT space and in the industrial space. Uh, you're going to start using a lot more uh, model driven and leveraging your data sets that you're collecting, uh, learning from that. And just due to the margin compression that the industry has kind of seen in the last four or five years, uh, APC gives these operators the ability to like, uh, while it's not a revolutionary change in terms of margin, like you're still talking like, uh, like savings in the order of millions of dollars of incremental revenue. And the savings aren't really in the lack of human intervention. It's mainly in terms of optimizing the assets you have and increasing production for the lowest possible cost. Okay, great. Well, thank you again, Diego. Uh, great presentation, um, really good questions and answers as well. Um, so thank you for joining us. And uh, this does to conclude our webinar for today. So thank you everyone again joining us and have a great rest of your day. Perfect. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Take care.